on where we're at as a county with COVID-19, how we're addressing it, and thanks to your help, uh, the work that has happened to date. Uh, first of all, the Board of County Commissioners just yesterday heard from Dr. Mark Johnson, who heads Jeffco Public Health. We're keeping a very close eye on COVID-19 cases to determine whether we're going to see a spike after Labor Day weekend and the opening of school. So we're watching that closely. Our goal is to get our case count below 290 cases over a two week period in order to move to the protect our neighbors phase. And as you all know so well from hearing Commissioner Ty and I talk about this issue, we deeply need our community's help to achieve those numbers. And our community has done a tremendous job wearing uh, masks, uh, also socially distancing, making sure uh, you're washing your hands. All of these are just absolutely critical to helping us prevent further spread. And we just wanna take a moment to thank you so much for all your, all your work. Um, it's also critical to our economic response and recovery, but we wanna do it in a way that is responsible and safe as, as you know so well. Um, commissioners uh, Ty, Zabel and I also approved 1.4 million uh, not too long ago for a partnership with Stride, an organization many of you may be familiar with, to increase testing, which is also a critical tool in helping to uh, prevent the spread along with our great team of contact tracers who reach out to members of our community who may have been exposed to COVID-19. Uh, it will also provide for additional help for testing with first responders, with our teachers, also communities disproportionately affected uh, by COVID-19, including uh, persons of color across Jefferson County, Latino, Latina, African-American, uh, and others. Jeffco Public Health also recently announced the official launch of a new team, the Office of Pandemic Response. That'll be part of the county's long-term COVID-19 response and recovery strategy. And the main purpose will be to limit COVID-19 spread in the community through at least the next two years by providing community impact support, conducting infection prevention and response, and collecting and assessing information for everyone in the county. And I think Dr. Johnson put it well when he said, having this dedicated team of experts to focus solely on response and recovery efforts, building on what we've learned over the last six months, will truly help reduce the burden of this virus and save lives. And we're so grateful for his leadership. He is retiring uh, in early October next month. And he's just been steadfast and a rock and, and tremendous throughout this whole effort. And we're all grateful for his work. And then finally, I'll just wrap up by sharing that uh, the Board of County Commissioners continues to earmark CARES Act money, dollars we receive from the federal government to help cities, local businesses, our nonprofits who are working very hard to address the, the uh, needs across our community from everything from rental assistance to food. Uh, we're also helping special districts like fire rescue districts and parks and rec that have been hit hard uh, during this pandemic, um, as well as schools. So we wanna thank you so much for all of your support. And those are some quick highlights from the county this morning. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Leslie. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for everyone in the community that's helping to fulfill those protocols. Anyone else, uh, elected officials? Uh, Lakewood City Council, anyone from council that uh, has anything to add this morning? If not, we will go to uh, Mayor Paul, who I see is, is with us this morning. All right. Thank you, Ron. Well, good morning, Wes Colfax and beyond. It's again, always great to be <clears throat> with you. Uh, I'll just be brief. Um, we've talked over the past few months about our budget situation and, and see some things with, you know, some things starting to trend upward, but not enough to dig us out of a $17 million hole for this year and next. So we had a, a two and a half, three hour study session on Monday night to really put the new budget out there in the community. You can go to lakewood.org or tune in to Lakewood Speaks if you'd like to watch that entire presentation and kind of see what's going on. It will be a bare bones budget, as you can imagine, but uh, hats off to our city manager and staff for really uh, putting together something that I think uh, really continues to provide a high level of service with much less. And um, so if you have any questions going forward, please let me know. There, uh, we had a, a, a great meeting kind of round table. We meet with the county commissioners in all the cities on a quarterly basis. And 
one of our main focuses has been homelessness. So we had an update on homelessness and trying to really better understand how we're coordinating. The county has hired a, a navigator for some time now, actually has had a navigator and now all the cities are filling in and we have two navigators in the city of Lakewood. So they're working hard to, to look at ways to address this uh, ongoing and growing issue. And I'm proud of the work that they're doing. And while it may seem slow, you can imagine how, how hard it is when you spend you know, a lot of time just working with one individual to help get them off the streets and then you know two three four more come into to come into that world so uh something to keep an eye on as we move forward and then also a challenging uh discussion that was somewhat put on hold because of covid and that is the jail the jefferson county jail and um as you know the county's faced some tremendous budget cuts or you know different things along the lines with their budget and that has really challenged the jail to be able to lodge those that need to be lodged. And I say that because we certainly, you know, uh, want to make sure that the appropriate people are going to jail and have a place to stay if they need to stay in jail. But COVID has limited that from, I think at one point, 1300 to 1400 is what the jail can hold. They've been down into below 600. And um, they'll be able to kind of tick up as things change. But when things do change, it's going to need to <clears throat> have um, some serious conversations throughout the, the county and the different cities as to how we can make sure that there's beds available for folks who need to be housed. So please, you know, stay tuned with that. It's, it's uh, an important part of, of a city function. And I welcome your, your input and feedback on that as we move forward and uh, have those discussions with Sheriff Schrader. So that is all that I have. Just a quick update. Again, Lakewood.org, Lakewood Speaks will have all the agenda items coming up, whether it's City Council or Planning Commission. And we really would love to see you continue to be engaged. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Paul. Uh, we will move to- I have a question. Go ahead. Ron, I have a question. Yes. Um, Mayor Paul, this is Dave Rockman. Uh, the question comes out of a Applewood Valley Association meeting we had yesterday evening of the board. And, you know, we've been thinking in part because a, a couple of us are involved with revisiting the Colfax 2040 vision plan. Uh, we kind of tasked the board of AVA to think about Colfax. So it was topic number one yesterday. I mention it because it's my understanding city council has also been thinking about and talking about uh, Westland in particular. And uh, I ask, can you share anything with us and with AVA in particular about Westland and any negotiations this city is undertaking about the future of Westland. But the larger point ultimately is, can the neighborhood be looped in with any information as there are developments that unfold in Westland? And so far we've been in the dark. So thank you in advance for this, Mayor Paul. Yep. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ruckman. <clears throat> Certainly, and, and we do have an agenda item on Westland coming before us. It'll actually be an executive session. And I think maybe Vanessa or Robert spoke to this at a previous meeting. There is, there is some movement there. It's an interesting ownership. I think there's two or three owners of Westland. For some reason the city of Lakewood owns the parking lot, but has a lot of reverters and restrictions on that. And <clears throat> I'll be just honest with you, it, West Colfax is a challenge. It was a challenge before COVID, it's gonna continue to be. There's also a challenge with folks wanting to invest in the city of Lakewood in some areas right now. Um, question 200, you know, whether no matter where you were on that, that, that scared some people away, but there is still a lot of opportunity there. So we can make sure to keep you in the loop um, and plugged in. There is something coming before us, and I can tell you the city is working hard on a lot of sites throughout the city, but especially West Colfax and Westland to find 
some folks that are, are willing to, to get in there and, and take a look and do some different things. I've had some great calls with great interest. There is, you know, investment from all throughout Denver that's creeping up the corridor towards Applewood. So that's good too, but it's a lot of timing there as well. Just so long as uh, the process is pretty transparent and we find out before council makes irrevocable decisions rather than afterward, please. Yes, sir, you bet. Unfortunately, you won't be able to participate in our executive session on Westland, but uh, you'll be able to be a, uh, sure. hear the news that comes out of that. Thank you, and thanks, Ron. You're welcome. Thanks, thanks, David. And and that's probably a great segue to go to uh, Lakewood Economic Development and uh, hear from Vanessa Zarate, who uh, will cover that and and maybe even uh, mention whatever she knows about West Colfax. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, as always, for having us. Um, I will try to be quick, as I know we have a packed agenda today. Um, one of the um, best ways to also find out what's going on is stay in touch with our news blast. We send out a news blast every Monday, and on it includes site plans that come in through the city, um, as well as there's a city planning cases map and our development highlights map. But those three sources are pretty good ways to get information and see what's coming up either in the pipeline and or starting construction or finishing construction and opening. If you would like to be added to that news blast, um, please shoot me your email and I'm happy to add you. Um, excuse me, a couple things we wanted to mention to y'all today. Um, we are still um, helping people temporarily expand outside. So if you are a business that would like to go outside or you know of a business that you know might benefit from going outside, please let me know and we can help get that process started um, and, and get them some extra seating. Um, the Energized Colorado Gap Fund was announced a couple of weeks ago, and this is a program through the state impact, um, for impacted small businesses and nonprofits. Their round one for applications has closed, but round two opens, I believe it's August or October 5th. Um, you can get up to $35,000 in a myriad of loans and grants. Um, all of the information you'll need to apply, all the documents you will need is on the website now. But um, I think it's energized, Col it is um, energizedcolorado.com. So please, if you are um, in need of that or know if people are interested, please let me know. Um, to the mayor's point, we have been working on quite a few projects um, and Colfax is, is still of interest to a lot of folks. Um, development can just be slow. So, um, you know, please stay involved. Please ask me questions. We're, we're working on it. Things just take some time. Um, can I answer any specific questions? Silence, okay. Let, let me know if you change your mind. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Vanessa. And as she said, she's always available as is the her whole team. So if you have questions uh, outside these meetings, just follow up directly. Uh, and uh, with that, we'll move to uh, the 40 West Arts District. Everybody, just a couple quick things, because like Vanessa mentioned, I know we have a really packed agenda today. So this Saturday, September 19th, from uh, starting at 11 until 2 p.m., we'll actually be partnering with the city of Edgewater on their event. It's a chalk walk and harvest festival. And that event is partially in celebration of the 40 West Art Line extending around the new um, Edgewater Civic Center and Library. So if you're interested, come out and see us. It gives you an opportunity to walk a little further along the newly minted and extended art line. And we'll also have a wonderful ground muralist out there that the city of Edgewater is supporting who will be doing a new ground mural um, and possibly not that day specifically, but during that week and it'll be completed leading up to the festival. So that should be really fun. Um, we are back to celebrating First Fridays. We don't have any food or drink. And of course, we're following all city and county and state guidelines. Um, but we really invite you to start coming back to the district um, anytime during open hours, but particularly First Fridays. So on October 2nd, we'll have the Art of Conservation and we'll be working with a group called Nature's Educators. They will have some of their birds of prey on site doing flights back and forth outside our gallery and a wonderful exhibition alongside all of our other galleries, which are all open for business and um, ready to make sales. 
Um, we are partnering with the city of Arvada on a major grant opportunity, a $225,000 grant opportunity to get money into the hands of artists who need relief. And just a heads up that that deadline to fill out the application has been extended to September 21st at midnight. So a huge thanks to Kevin Yoshida for leading up that project. And if you are an artist living in the city of Arvada or you know an artist li living in the city of Arvada, please get this grant opportunity out to them because it's a really awesome opportunity to get um, some quick win money in. And then finally, we are moving forward with the AARP grant. I know we've announced that award in previous meetings. It's a really awesome grant opportunity. We'll be doing a new fence art installation at Pearson Colfax. We will be doing hopefully a ground mural installation there as well. And then we have something called a joy bomb happening on September 23rd with the group Handsome Little Devils. And if you're not sure what a joy bomb is, I wasn't either. Basically some folks will be walking around with big costumes and bikes with all kinds of accoutrements and little um, cars that they'll be moving around the district in celebration and launch of the AARP grant award. And that'll be happening September 23rd from four to six, all outdoors in the district. And if you have any other questions, you can always follow us on Facebook and look for more information. Thanks so much. Thank you, Liz. Thank you so much. Is, is the green stripe painted to the new part of uh, up by Edgewater? It is. In fact, the green line has been repainted across the entirety of the 40 West Art Line, including this new spot, this new location in Edgewater. So it's looking really spiffy. We've been doing a bunch of graffiti abatement and just updating artwork. So get your art line visits in this fall before winter hits. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we will move to the uh, Lakewood West Colfax bid. Hi, Kevin Yoshida here. Um, uh, just a quick update from the Lakewood West Colfax Business Improvement District. Uh, as uh, teased in some earlier comments there, we're focused on the uh, 2040 plan and looking, uh, Bill's holding it up right now, uh, doing a, a f uh, previous five years, what's happened since, since the plan's inception and uh, thinking forward to what are the priorities for the next five years. So uh, thanks to all of our ambassadors. We had a great first meeting. Um, we're gonna meet again tomorrow. So a, a reminder to, to that group uh, from 11.45 to one o'clock. Uh, you'll see an email reminder come out before the end of the day. And uh, for that group, please uh, do your homework. We're going to do a, a, a deep dive into uh, uh, Chapter 1, Cultural Identity, and Chapter 4, Placemaking, and, and have a good discussion. So thanks very much. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, I was going to remind people that, that are involved in that to do their homework as well. So you beat me to the punch. Um, so that it's great to see how structured that is. And th there's going to be a lot, of, a lot of activity over the next... Uh, 90 days or so, so it's, it's great to see that move forward. Uh, and we will go to uh, West Metro Fire. Doesn't look like we have a representative here uh, from West Metro Fire. Uh, I think they were in transition a little bit last month. So we'll reach out and make sure that they, they're plugged back in for, for next month. Uh, Lakewood Police. If we don't have anyone here from uh, Lakewood Police, I guess we're, we're 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 kind of on our own. So that's that's kind of a scary thought. No one's here to, to watch over us. Um, that gives us a little more more time uh, to to move into the uh, the candidate and, and ballot uh, measures, uh, and, and we'll we'll move into that. And I think we can put the the use to good time. Uh, we are going to start with the, the, the individuals that are running for the Jeffco County Commissioner's spot. And Mr. Marino is uh, going to be our official timekeeper. And when you hear this sound, oh, he's on mute. <laughs> oh. When you hear that, oh, I still didn't quite hear it. I don't know. When you see that sound, uh, he, he, you'll hear a ding, uh, or you'll hear one of us say 30 seconds. 
uh, to, to give you a, a note that you need to start wrapping things up. We're going to allow each uh, candidate uh, three minutes to, to talk about their, their candidacy. Um, I would ask each one to uh, share where people can contact them uh, for more information and follow-up questions. We don't have time today for Q&A with the candidates so we're going to limit that part of it uh, because we've got to get through the, the commissioner's seats, uh, the, the, the DA's uh, position, and then uh, we're going to talk about uh, three of the, the ballot measures that we, we think are important. Um, so without further ado, we're going to start with uh, the Jefferson County Commissioner's District 1, and we have two candidates. Uh, and we will start with uh, Libby uh, Sasbo as uh, the first individual. And Libby, if you are here, we will turn the floor over to you for, for three minutes. Great. Thank you, Ron. Thank you for having me this morning. You know, the West Colfax area holds a special place in my heart. The first eight years of my life, I grew up in West Denver, just two blocks on the east side of Sheridan. Me and my single mom did all our shopping and activities in Jeffco. My mom would get her hair done at the Dollhouse Beauty Salon over there on Colfax. And one of my favorite memories was having dinner at the Drumstick Restaurant. I loved watching that train go round and round and the chicken was so delicious. When I was 10, we moved to Jeffco. And one of my favorite places to hang out was Westland Mall. My friends and I got to spend a lot of our time at Yarbrough's candy store and strolling through Fashion Bar. I am truly a homegrown Jeffco girl. West Colfax is an area that brings back a lot of great memories. And I'm so excited to see how you all are revitalizing this area through the amazing arts district we just talked about and promoting small business to come back. Thank you, Kevin. So it makes I'm hoping that as we revitalize, it's gonna make memories for the next generation of Jeffcoites. I grew up here in Jeffco and I've raised a family here. Our family owned a small business here for decades. I know the most important thing is you, the citizen that makes Jefferson County their home. I am running for reelection because in these unstable times, Jeffco needs someone with experience leading the county and creating the policies that drive improvements. My experience serving in the state legislature and the last five and a half years serving as your Jeffco commissioner is unmatched. As we approach the next few years, it is going to take tenacity and experience to tackle our budget issues and recover from the impacts of COVID-19. I have already demonstrated that I can be a bold leader in story time, stormy times by making sure the CARES dollars the county has gotten gets into the right hands, like our businesses and our nonprofits that serve our communities. I know the heavy hand of uh, burden of government does not provide the opportunity for you to live your American dream. I have always made sure that the people's voice is not outweighed by government intervention. In this current situation, we need leadership and experience, plus the relationships that bring the county to the next level. We need to have a regional plan for homelessness, as we the commissioners talked about at length yesterday. The board has seen a lot of turnover the last few years and will experience more turnover next year. I would be honored if you reelect me, I will be the only commissioner that has more than a few years experience. And that experience is vital to Jeffco. You can see me and what I stand for and who I am at my website, LibbyZabo.org. Thank you for your consideration. Again, LibbyZabo.org. Thank you, Libby. Spot on time-wise, so we appreciate you being here. Uh, we will move next to uh, the other candidate in uh, District 1, uh, Tracy Kraftharp. Tracy, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much. It's good to be here again. I'm Tracy Kraftharp, and I'm running for County Commissioner in District 1. Um, as you know, in Jefferson County, everybody votes. Um, so 
I've, I've been here before. Um, I used to work around the corner um, on what's Colfax. Uh, I ran the Gemini house with Family Tree um, over on Colfax and Sims. Spent a lot of time at the Perkins having uh, meetings over there. So I have deep roots in this community. As I said, I worked for Family Tree. I ran the Adolescent Crisis Shelter, the Gemini House, and the Battered Women's Shelter, Women in Crisis. Um, and I also have served on the um, Jeffco Public Schools District Accountability Committee, the um, City of Arvada Human Resources Committee for 10 years, where they invited me into their city council to give me an award and said, okay, goodbye now. Um, so that was a, a good experience. Um, also served on the Capital Recommendations Committee for the City of Arvada. So in addition to that, I've served as a consultant for nonprofits and small businesses for 15 years, my own small business. Um, I, have, I am the state representative in House District 29, which is North and East Arvada, the Jefferson County part of Westminster. And during my time, I have earned a reputation for being uh, business friendly. I've served for four years as the vice chair of the Business Affairs and Labor Committee and as four years as the chair of the Business Affairs and Labor Committee. My premier um, accomplishment in the state legislature has been working at simplifying our sales and use tax. I see everybody rolling their eyes at that one. You know that um, sales tax in Colorado is the most complicated in the country. And that is because uh, we have our state system and then our um, local home rule system. Um, so we are working on and working closely with uh, Mayor Paul, I'm not seeing you Mayor Paul, um, for Lakewood to join in to simplify that system because that's pretty important for businesses to be able to um, make sure that you're not spending a day and a half every month submitting your sales tax. So hopefully we can um, bring Lakewood on and, and um, uh, really work on that system. So in addition to that, oh, already. So there's three things to let you know about me that um, differentiates me from my opponents. One is um, I am accessible. Two is I, I bring people together. I find common ground. Three, the third thing is, is I get things done. I don't just talk, talk, talk. So it's good to be here again. I've really enjoyed these meetings. Um, asking for your support. I'm Tracy Kraft Tharp. I'm running for District 1 County Commissioner. Tracy for Jeffco.com. Thanks. Ron, you're um, muted. Okay. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, uh, Libby for, from District 1. We appreciate uh, you being here with us today. Um, I, I will also note that on the chat box, you can, uh, each of the candidates can post up a, uh, uh, a message with their um, contact information. Uh, and I note that uh, Joni Inman, who we're going to hear from next on District 2, has has done that. So I would encourage each of the candidates uh, as they talk, they can give it their contact, but you can also add it there. So, and without further ado, we're gonna move to the uh, the candidates for uh, District 2 of the Jefferson County Commissioners. Uh, and we will hear first from uh, Joni Inman. So Joni, the, the floor is yours. Hi everybody, I am Joni Inman. I'm candidate for County Commissioner in District 2. And if we were live, we'd be sitting in District 2. But as Tracy mentioned, the entire county votes for all county commissioner seats. It's a little bit nostalgic for me to hear Mayor Paul uh, talking about the redevelopment of Westland because I was very much a part of the first redevelopment of Westland. And if you'll recall, we had banner towing airplanes and all kinds of celebrations when uh, we redeveloped Westland the first time. I'm delighted to be here because in 2006, as the director of the mayor and city manager's office, I approved the first $20,000 check out of our special projects budget to seed the West Colfax Business Improvement District. And now with over seven and a half million in projects completed or near completion, I am very proud to say that was money well spent. I love this community. I went to Dunstan Junior High and Bear Creek High School. I met my husband right here at a nightclub on Colfax. 
He bought my engagement ring from Purvis Jewelers. I worked as a realtor at Colfax and Kipling, and even very briefly as a hostess, waitress, and cook at a four-table Chinese restaurant on Colfax. It was the end, end cap of that old motel. We bought our piano and reams of sheet music and hundreds of reeds for saxophones and bassoons at Rockley Music. And my husband has had his art displayed at the 40 West Art Gallery and so much more. We raised all four of our children here. And many of you remember when I was a newspaper reporter covering Lakewood School District and the county. I am part of the tapestry of Jefferson County and I'm part of the tapestry of the West Colfax community. And now I'm running for county commissioner. I'm a small business owner myself. If you combine my professional experience as a business consultant, former deputy city manager and director of the mayor's office in Lakewood, as well as having served on the board of trustees for St. Anthony Hospital and later VP of Public Affairs, I think you will agree that my management experience in both business and local government makes me the most qualified candidate for this office. My priorities are responsible, competent management of taxpayer dollars, community safety, a flourishing business environment, and empowering families in need. Unlike state government, unlike state government, our local officials have the most immediate impact on our daily lives. And I would be honored to represent you. Joni for Jeffcoat.com. Thank you very much, Joni. We appreciate you being with us today. And we will move to uh, the other candidate for District 2, Andy Kerr. I see Andy is with us. The floor is yours, Andy. Great. Uh, thanks, Ron. And thanks, everyone, for being here this morning. And I really appreciate this opportunity to uh, chat about uh, West Colfax and uh, as Sounds like uh, many of us uh, done a bit of growing up myself uh, along here. I remember when my family first uh, moved here to Lakewood that one of the first things everyone said is got to get out there to Casa Bonita. And uh, 40 years later, I was taking my kids uh, there as well. Uh, one thing that uh, we know for certain is that whoever is the next commissioner from District 2 will have attended Dunstan Junior High School because I did as well. And uh, many people also know me as a teacher there. I know uh, Bill's son was in my uh, class there, one of my first years uh, teaching. And uh, Bill, I, I hope he's recovered uh, from that. Uh, good <laughs> thumbs up there. Uh, I, wanna, I wanna make sure that uh, folks know that uh, the, the deep amount of experience that uh, many of us bring uh, to this race from our, our time in the state legislature. I served in the legislature for 12 years, serving on the business, finance, appropriations committees, along with uh, many other. Um, obviously, I uh, was on the education committee in both the House and the Senate and chaired the Senate, uh, the Senate Education Committee uh, as well for, for tier two years. Uh, being a teacher, I think it's important for people to bring their uh, personal experiences uh, there. Uh, I've seen over the years the changes along uh, West Corridor from uh, when I, I first went out there. I, I don't know, what is it about Dutch Brothers? Every time I can't find my teenage daughter, she is with her friends at Dutch Brothers. I, I do find my iPhone and there she is. But uh, it's, it's great seeing the businesses uh, move in there. Uh, Yabby Hut, which is in South Lakewood right now is open has uh, opened there and uh, that's my my son's favorite place to go. So uh, we're looking forward to spending our, our time and and money there. Uh, some of you might also uh, know me uh, from uh, obviously growing up in Green Mountain. Um, the uh, the Rockley family and I went to high school together and I've known that family for for many, many years. I'm an adjunct teacher at REMCAD and uh, very happy to see that campus uh, flourishing. In fact, I've invited uh, multiple governors to come sign some of my bills there, uh, on that campus. So with that, my priorities are definitely to revitalize and recharge uh, Jefferson County's economy. I wanna make sure that uh, we are using science and data to address any crisis that 
like the crisis we're <laughs> facing right now. And I want to make sure that uh, we're bringing our, our homegrown experience uh, to, uh, to the Jefferson County Commission. Thanks. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move now to the uh, candidates for the district attorney's uh, office. And both of those individuals are here with us today. And we will hear first from Matthew Durkin. Well, good morning. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Matthew Durkin and I'm running to be your next district attorney here in Jefferson and Gilpin counties. In April of 2018, Andrew Genesek, a graduate of Devlin High School where my daughter currently is going to school, just went out to get barbecue for his girlfriend. What he didn't know was that as he was going to get barbecue just a few blocks from where we meet, he was being hunted by three individuals who came into Lakewood from Denver, two of them with felony convictions, with a toy, which was code for a gun, to do work, which was code for taking your money. As he got out of his car alone, he was pinned in. One of the defendants got out and shot him and killed him. As he was struggling for his life, they ran over him and then drove to Arvada, did a drive-by shooting. They returned to Denver where they laughed about what they had done because they had gotten their money for the drugs that they were looking for. They returned to Lakewood the next day and committed an aggravated robbery. I was part of a team and led a team that got justice for that senseless act of violence, that murder of Andrew Genesek. Sadly, one year later, there was a replicate, almost a duplicate crime off of Teller Street, just north of Belmar. I supervised that team that is seeking justice for that senseless homicide. And just a few weeks ago, across the street from where we meet, in the parking lot of the Walmart, I was part of a team that filed charges for the murder of two brothers there. I was born in Jefferson County. I was raised here. This is where we're raising our beautiful family. I love our community, but I hate to see what's happening to it. We have a drug addiction crisis that's fueling a crime wave. And I agree with Mayor Paul's comments at our last meeting that we celebrate the unique nature of the Colfax corridor, but we can and must do better. We can and must do better because drug addiction and violence ruin victims, they ruin offenders, and they have a negative impact on the business community. It's been my honor to serve my community for the last 25 years as a DA in the office where I'm currently a chief DA. I also have experience in running a prosecutor's office as the deputy attorney general uh, where I supervised a $10 million budget 70 employees and worked with both Democrat and Republicans at the forefront of criminal justice reform. I am proud to have served this community with putting public safety over politics to get justice in each and every case. I'm proud to have earned the endorsement of our current DAP Weir, Sheriff Schrader, Republican and Democrat elected DAs from around the state and even the Denver Post. Please join me in my vision for putting away the worst recidivism rate, one of the worst recidivism rates in the country at nearly 50% by Im implementing effective drug treatment for offenders. Please go to durkin4da.com. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Matthew. And we will move to uh, the second candidate, Alexis King, who uh, I see is with us. So Alexis, the, the floor is yours. Good morning. My name is Alexis King. I'm running to be the first woman to lead our Jefferson County District Attorney's Office. I grew up on the west side of Colorado Springs and after college worked at a sex assault and domestic violence nonprofit where I saw firsthand how the decision making of the prosecutor's office really determined the safety of survivors. It's what brought me to law school at the University of Denver. And after clerking for a judge, I came to Jefferson County to be a deputy district attorney. And it's where I've stayed to raise my family. I served over 10 years in the Jefferson County District Attorney's Office. I prosecuted all nature of crime, but after five years became very frustrated with the ultimate question of were we making our community safer? No one was ready to have that conversation in adult courts but in the juvenile courts, where the goal is collaborative and outcome-based, I was able to focus my energy on finding new ways to address old problems. I helped launch two diversionary tracks for juveniles to keep them out of the system. 
one focused on sexting because smartphones and juveniles are a bad combination. And the other one focused on keeping 10, 11, and 12 year olds out of detention facilities where we know that the outcome is poor. Because of that collaborative and community-based leadership with our schools and with law enforcement and nonprofit programs here and human services, I became our human trafficking prosecutor where I worked with both the FBI, local law enforcement, legislators and the elected district attorneys across the state of Colorado to make a meaningful impact both on the policy side and the legislative side, making sure that we had mandatory minimums for those who trafficked. I had a number of cases that came in and out of the Colfax corridor, uh, particularly around trafficking issues. And I know that we have a lot of work to do. Right now, drug filings in Jefferson County as of 2019, as of 2018, have increased by 24%. And yet we don't have a lot of new solutions coming from places other than our law enforcement agencies, but not the district attorney's office. I have a reputation as a problem solver in the community, building relationships and addressing problems head on. After I left the district attorney's office, I was a magistrate judge in Denver where I worked on bail bond reform to increase transparency and accountability and to diminish bias in our criminal justice system, to ensure that they weren't over-incarcerating people facing poverty, mental illness, and addiction. As your district attorney, I want to bring further transparent governance to how we as district attorneys are using our profound power in the community. I am, have been running for a year to increase bail bond reform efforts here in the community to make sure we aren't over incarcerating folks and have better answers and solutions for them. To create a pre-file diversion program so that not every single person has to go through the courthouse, that we can connect them with services and stabilize them in the community. And to increase transparency so that we can be very honest as public servants about our efforts and whether or not people are being treated the same or differently based on their identity in our criminal justice system. My name is Alexis King. I'm running to be your next district attorney and the first woman to leave this office, and I'd be honored to have your vote. There's more information, including my phone number in the chat. I welcome any questions or comments you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, it, we're, we're going to move now to the agenda where we have three ballot uh, items that are coming up, and uh, the first one we're going to hear about is the Gallagher Amendment, uh, which we've had plenty of discussion at our WCCA board. Uh, and we're, we're honored to have uh, Mike uh, Feely here today who will uh, talk about the Gallagher Amendment. Bill? Um, thanks, thanks very much. It's very nice to see so many old friends on the gallery. Um, um, as, as, th as Ron says, um, we're, the voters are going to be facing uh, Amendment B this November. Amendment B is a measure referred uh, by the legislature to the voters, uh, really with a bipartisan, a strong bipartisan support and a bipartisan recognition that the accumulated unintended consequences of the Gallagher Amendment over the last 40 years needs, uh, needs to be addressed. Uh, I know that a lot of folks on this call have a fundamental grounding in Gallagher, but I think it's important to understand the complexity and what's happened over the last 40 years since Gallagher was uh, adopted in, the, in 1982. Um, on the face of it, Gallagher was more about ensuring businesses paid a fair share of property taxes than it was about keeping property taxes low. Colorado actually has the third lowest effective residential property taxes in the country. Uh, Gallagher doesn't cap property taxes, rather it establishes a formula that sets property tax rates, the assessed valuations, based on the relationship between the total value of property taxes on all of Colorado's homes as compared to the value of all the property taxes collected on the state's business and commercial property, farms, ranches, and industrial facilities. Specifically, the Gallagher formula requires that 45% of the total property taxes collected in the state originate from property taxes paid on homes and residential properties, and the remaining 55% of the total property tax revenues uh, are to be derived from commercial property uh, and commercial property owners. Gallagher also establishes the assessed valuation rate that commercial properties have to pay at 29%. That is the same assessed valuation uh, as, as it was in 1982 when Gallagher was passed. 
Gallagher directs the legislature uh, to increase or decrease the property tax rate that homeowners pay against the backdrop of a 29% assessed valuation for the non-residential or commercial property so that the 55-45% ratio between commercial and residential tax collections can be maintained. Um, the residential, what Amendment B would do is it would freeze the residential rate, which currently is 7.9%, and it is anticipated that it would be uh, left alone without the passage of Amendment B, it would be reduced to 5.88%. Um, really, Gallagher has shifted the burden of funding our local property taxes uh, and, the, and the services that are provided through the local property taxes to commercial taxpayers. Uh, the explosion of value in residential property and uh, while we've had significant growth in commercial property, the explosion of value in residential property has forced the legislature to adjust that 55-45% ratio so that right now a commercial property owner is paying about four times the, the rate that a residential property owner is paying. Without Amendment B uh, passing, they pay about five times the rate. Um, one of the issues that comes up is we want to make clear that this is uh, that Amendment B does not anticipate or create any tax increases. TABOR is still in effect. It's unaffected by Referendum B. And TABOR specifically in its language requires that any tax policy, any tax change resulting in a net revenue increase or any assessed valuation can only take place uh, upon a vote of the people. The legislature or local government cannot by themselves without a vote of the people increase the assessed valuation rate on, on, any, on any, any property. Um, it it, se it uh, seems that the, while uh, we've had some significant savings of residential property taxes since uh, 1982, 40 years have really skewed it so that uh, in addition to the commercial property taxpayers bearing the, bearing the burden, um, that uh, there is some real uh, risk to our school districts, to our fire departments, to our hospital districts throughout the state, um, that they are squeezed more and more by the decrease in the assessed valuation for residential property taxes. Um, uh, so uh, with a bipartisan effort, uh, this has been tried before, but I think that uh, it's finally been a coalescence of interests and a recognition of the unintended consequences that Gallagher, which once served a purpose, uh, uh, has, has wrought over the last 40 years that uh, we can address it this November uh, with uh, Amendment B. I hope that folks on this call and uh, talk to their friends and consider uh, supporting the amendment and voting for the amendment so that we have changes made to our, the way we fund some of our most important local resources. Ron, you're muted. Ron? Sorry about that. Um, uh, I, thank you very much for the, that input. And we have some in, uh, information on these ballot initiatives available on the westcolfax.org uh, website with the agenda. So uh, take a look at that. Uh, give this, uh, uh, this uh, amendment your serious consideration because it it is significant, as, as uh, Mike has indicated, and we appreciate you being here to share those thoughts. Um, Thank you. Next, we will move to uh, Proposition 116, and we have uh, Chris Kennedy with us today to uh, give us uh, some input on that. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's good to see your faces. I am still feeling bummed that I don't get to see you guys more often. It's one of my, you know, during the legislative session, I know I never made it down to WCCA very often, but I always liked getting back there in the summer and the fall and hearing about what you guys are doing. And also, I just always walked away with uh, such a positive feeling about the future of Lakewood because there's so much energy and commitment from the people whose faces I'm seeing right here who've been pouring work into this long before I was really active in, in Lakewood. So thank you guys for doing what you do. Uh, so Proposition 116 is an income tax cut. The, the policy itself is not very complex to explain. Our current income tax rate in Colorado is 4.63%. It's across the board. It's a flat tax rate. So no matter your income, you know, after your deductions and whatnot, that's what you pay, 4.63. 
uh, this would cut it to 4.55%. Uh, there are the estimates are that that would reduce state revenues by an average of 154 million per year, and by a quirk of the timing, it's going to be closer to 203 million dollars in reduced revenue in the first fiscal year for Colorado. So, what does this really mean for our state? Well, because of the way it's it's structured, even a flat tax rate is generally speaking. Uh, somewhat regressive, but the way these cuts work out after the uh, after the deductions and exemptions is such that the average Colorado taxpayer would get a $37 check at the end of the year. That's based on an income of $46,000, but that would be more like an $800 check if your income is a million dollars a year, and it just goes up from there. So while I certainly recognize that there are a lot of people in this time that could use some extra dollars in their pocket, these dollars really aren't going to the people who need the help most right now. In fact, 55% of the dollars from this tax cut would go to the top 3% of income earners in Colorado. Uh, so what does this mean for the state budget? Well, last year, we cut $3.3 billion from the state budget. Now, this was offset in part by federal relief. We got $1.7 billion from the CARES Act that we had to use for very targeted things, but we found some ways to offset some of the cuts to K-12 and higher education with that. And I won't go down the rabbit hole of what a bad job Colorado is doing funding our transportation infrastructure right now, but I think many of you know our funding for transportation is lacking as well. So we cut $3.3 billion. Uh, that's about 25% of the general fund. It was partially offset by federal relief. This year, it's gonna be even worse. All the economic forecasts show that we're in a more dire position where we're talking about another 20% cut to the general fund. That's about another $2.5 billion. And that's before we even talk about this income tax cut. So if we cut these income taxes, it's another $154 million a year or 200 in the first year on top of that. So what does that mean for the state budget? Well, that's the entire cost of the senior homestead exemption for one thing. We pay about $160 million a year in tax breaks to seniors to help them afford to stay in their homes. Now, to be honest, it's on uncertain whether we'll be able to fund that this year anyway, but an additional tax cut of that magnitude makes it even harder to do that. Um, full day kindergarten, which we expanded two years ago, cost the state $198 million a year. That entire line item is gonna be difficult to maintain anyway, even more so with this income tax cut. According to our school funding formula, it's about 18,000 kids across our state are paid for by this amount. And then I calculated in terms of teacher salaries. The average teacher salary in Colorado is about 58,000. It's closer to 63,000 in, in Jeffco. But let's just round up to $100,000 a year and assume that that includes all the, the benefits we pay for these teachers. We're talking about 2,000 teacher jobs that we fund, that would potentially be cut because of this tax cut. And while, like I said at the beginning, it's certainly understandable that people want a few extra dollars in their pockets right now because this is a tough time. What I would argue is that the, the hardworking families across our state need good teachers more than they need an extra $37 in their pocket. So that is why I'm voting no on Proposition 116, and I hope you guys all join me and vote no as well. Thank you. Thank you for sharing those thoughts. Uh, again, there's uh, some information available uh, under this item on the agenda. Take a look at that uh, and give this matter your attention as well. Uh, our last uh, ballot item that we're gonna have some discussion on is the special election ballot question 2B. And we have Peter Wall with us here today to uh, talk about that uh, ballot item. Peter, the, the floor is yours. Good morning. Thanks, everyone, for having me. It's nice to see some friendly faces. Again, appreciate the time. Uh, again, my name is Peter Wall. I'm here on behalf of the 2B campaign, which is the Citizens Initiative uh, to approve adult use cannabis sales, which is going to be on the ballot um, this November in 2020. Um, 2B is that Citizens Initiative, which would allow uh, the 10 existing medicinal stores in Lakewood to sell adult use cannabis um, to individuals that are over 21 years of age. Um, our campaign collected nearly 10,000 signatures um, to petition onto the November 2nd ballot. You know, no matter how you, you feel about cannabis, um, it is hard to argue that cannabis is coming in into Lakewood and, and into the community. 
Um, it continues to come from the black market um, and it's being purchased in neighboring cities such as Edgewater, Denver, and Wheat Ridge. Um, unfortunately, you know, those residents that are purchasing cannabis outside of Lakewood are, are being forced to spend their hard-earned dollars um, in those other jurisdictions. And the city continues to lose out on extremely valuable sales tax revenue that could go towards public safety, road improvements, parks and open space, youth programs. Um, the list is really endless. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of other cities that we see out there that have used these dollars um, for good. In particular, Aurora, you know, built a $27 million uh, recreation center with every single dollar coming from cannabis tax revenue. Uh, Adams County has a great scholarship program where they take all of their revenue and they give it to, to children that wouldn't be able to actually go to uh, college. Uh, there's uh, Edgewater, for example, building another recreation center. Um, they've fixed all of the roads and transportation infrastructure. Um, these dollars are obviously extremely important and even more important um, in light of uh, Mayor Paul and, and uh, the city of Lakewood announcing that they're going to be cutting $17 million from their budget in 20 in 2021. I want to highlight that um, this citizens initiative uh, takes an extremely conservative approach with regards to retail sales. As I previously mentioned, it only allows the existing 10 medical stores to sell retail cannabis. And it was crafted in such a way so that any of those stores, if they were not in good standing uh, with the state and with Lakewood as of April 2020, uh, they wouldn't be able to sell medical cannabis or retail cannabis within the city of Lakewood, um, something which we believe is, is a privilege and not a right. Um, since Colorado legalized retail sales in 2012, um, there's been many uh, questions that have been answered. Um, youth usage has remained flat and even some circumstances it's gone down. Graduation rates are up, dropout rates are down. Uh, crime has remained flat or even gone down in certain circumstances. So a lot of those you know, pie in the sky on answer questions have been answered over the last particularly six years since retail sales took off in 2014. Um, I will be happy to open it up for questions, but if you'd like more information, um, please visit our website, www.strongerlakewood.com. And I think the last thing that I'll close with is um, Lakewood will be almost the hundredth jurisdiction if, if residents decide to approve to, to be this fall to allow for retail cannabis sales. That's almost 100 across the entire state of Colorado. And to date, not a single one of those jurisdictions has repealed um, retail cannabis sales. And really, I think the main reason is because the value that they're getting in terms of that tax revenue, some of the lower rates in youth usage, cutting into the black market, those benefits far outweigh some of the perceived downsides. So thank you again for the time. And again, uh, more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for being here. Uh, there is information on uh, this agenda item as well. Um, so we appreciate uh, all three hearing from all three of these these ballot items. Uh, so uh, and with that, um, on the agenda, the next item is the uh, an update on the uh, Paycheck Protection Program loans. There really isn't a whole lot going on. It's still kind of in a holding pattern on the forgiveness phase. Uh, my CPA firm has been working with a lot of clients. If, if there's any questions that we can help you with on kind of where that stands, uh, we'll let you know. Uh, we we uh, are, are monitoring that process and, and we'll continue to provide some information to the WCCA membership through the website as things continue to evolve. Uh, and we will now move to uh, Katie Ziegler, who will give us a quick uh, social media tip before we get into the community updates. Yeah, good morning, guys. Let's get this open here. All right, I hope everybody can see that. Some nodding, yes. Yeah, great. All right, so uh, we're heading into the end of the year, and I've shared a lot of social media tips with you guys, but I have a few more to sort of round out 2020. Now, this one I've touched on in other presentations, which you can go look back at uh, in our meeting archive, but I wanted to highlight this specifically today as we see the social internet start to change uh, over the next year. I'm sure most of you have noticed by now, Facebook looks different. It's also uh, engaging with its audiences differently. So I wanna just stress the idea of in your social media and marketing campaigns, creating themed days. Um, 
we all know that if you nail a TikTok dance or you post a really funny meme or you are able to post news, you know, on Facebook, that that is really, really great for your engagement rates. Uh, but so is predictability and themed days, things your audiences can directly relate to and rely on. Uh, so one of the things that I pulled was uh, Westfax on Twitter. They're very, very good at like Friday at like, I think it's like 2.43 p.m. every Friday, they release their list uh, for their tap list for the weekend. So I always know, okay, if I wanna go to Westfax this weekend, here's exactly when and exactly what they're going to offer me. Now that is not so much a themed day as it is just being consistent, but honestly, it's a themed day in my opinion because it's beer day. I know exactly what I'm getting and when. So I would encourage all of you to be consistent with your scheduled updates and new releases so your audience knows when to look for them and where to look for them. Use hashtags that are in your niche. Uh, hashtag, Westfax uses like hashtag Colorado beer pretty often or uh, like hashtag brew tap, et cetera. So find things that your audience is already engaged in and relating to and use it to build an archive. Uh, this kind of can gamify what you're doing. So other examples of theme days are like for us on the West Colfax Facebook page, which I know all of you engage in. Um, we ask a question on every Monday uh, relating to something on West Colfax, asking you guys to tell us your favorite stories. So if you're not doing that, I'd welcome you to come get involved and talk to me on the internet. But most importantly, um, understand that by doing that, you're asking to create a sense of nostalgia. We also do throwback Thursdays and things like that, stuff you're already familiar with, but I just wanted to take this time this week to stress the importance. We all see a ton of stuff on social media. Creating spaces where things are consistent matters to your audience. So that's it. As usual, tag us if you have something important you'd like us to see. We'll share it and we'll talk to you on the internet. Thank you, Katie. Uh, nice shout out for Westfax. Uh, yeah. Uh, to, uh, strong members of uh, WCCA, really good people. So. And crushing uh, it on the internet. <laughs> um, interesting names for their their um, their beers as well. Um, so uh, with, with that, we're going to move into the community updates, and we'll we'll try to go through this very quickly. We're we're pretty much on schedule, and that's a. Uh, that, that's a good thing because we, we weren't sure how this would work with the, with the candidates forums and we appreciate all the, the people that have been here today that are running for office and, and uh, that, that give us, gave us updates on the ballot and issues, uh, kind of being mindful of the, the time for everybody's schedule. Uh, and with that, we, we'll start out with the Rocky Mountain College of Art and Design. Do we have anybody here from, from RIMCAD? I can cover them because uh, I know some stuff that's going okay. on. Uh, so REMCAD currently is hosting a ton of online Zoom content that is for their students, but a lot of it is also free and open to the public. So they have a visiting artist, scholar, and design program. And on November 19th, they're going to have artist Liz Montague come and speak, and you can even do one-on-one -on -one courses with her. Uh, they also will have artist Detour, who did a mural in 40 West Arts District, coming to speak. So I would encourage you to check out REMCAD's calendar on their website website, which is remcad.edu. It's a great way to learn some stuff about art and have go to these fun little uh, free open session webinars with them. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Uh, Lakewood Arts. Anyone here from Lakewood Arts today? No? Okay. Uh, Two Creeks neighborhood? Um, uh, we're having, Two Creeks is having their um, monthly meeting this Saturday. Uh, we have two developers coming in to speak to us. We're working on the annual meeting that we'll have October 13th and um, trying to understand the blight designation. And there's a couple of us from the board that are also working on the 2040 plan um, upgrade. So we're having a good time with that. So that's what we're doing right now. Okay. Thank you, Kathy, as always. Uh, Iber neighborhood? Uh, nothing to report. Okay. Uh, Morse Park. Applewood Valley. Hey, Ron. Uh, we had a board meeting yesterday evening 
we set the annual meeting for Thursday, I believe, November 14th, uh, which will be by Zoom. We really focused on Colfax. And I want to leave with people here when we look at the west part of West Colfax, in other words, let's say Kipling going west in Lakewood, uh, we can think of three community places. And so as we revisit West Colfax 2040 vision, those three places are important to our neighborhood. One is uh, we uh, Westland, another is Denver West, and the third is the Mills. Westland is up for grabs at this point since it's substantially dead. And I wanna mention, rather than turning it into something else, I wanna leave with our membership here, it ought to stay a public place, a public space, something special for the community rather than just a job center or something else. So stay tuned on that. But that's what we did at Applewood Valley yesterday. Thanks for the time. Thank you, David. Uh, as someone that lives on the far west end of uh, the West Colfax corridor, I'm, I'm in your corner. So we'll, we'll make sure that that gets adequate attention as we uh, go through the, the, the vision uh, process. So Thank I you. appreciate that. Uh, Daniels Welchester, also uh, a West West End uh, corridor community. Anybody here from Daniel West Welchester? Okay. Uh, North Lakewood Advocates. Well, I see uh, Mr. Hilton is here from the Lakewood Elks. Uh, Jerry, can you give us an update? You're on mute. Oh, yes. You go. Okay. Uh, well, we have been thriving as much as you can with the pandemic, but we have cut back our hours and our days. So we're open Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. We have food on all those occasions because we're open as a restaurant. Uh, as far as our safety for the pandemic, your temperature is taken as you walk into the lodge. and We've got a direct route around a entry and exit so that we keep the distance between us but since we have such a large patio we have had two bands on every friday and saturday all this month i'm going to prog progress into next month with the same schedule so we're doing as best we can with the new guidelines that we're working with and we welcome anybody to come in and join the festivities especially on friday and saturday because uh, Wednesdays we have bocce, but that's our last game today. And then Thursday we have our bar bingo. And then we have live music on Friday and Saturday. If anybody has any questions, please let me know. Thank you. As a uh, fellow member of uh, Lakewood Lodge 1777, I uh, also uh, concur with Jerry. It's, it, things are, are doing well. The, the live music is, is refreshing. So... It's a nice opportunity to get out in a, in a socially distanced uh, format to hear some live music. Uh, Jerry is, is uh, subbing on our bocce team tonight, so that should be interesting for us to close out the year with he and I throwing the bocce ball, but uh, that's, a, that's a different thing. Um, so with that, uh, West Metro uh, Chamber of Commerce, anyone here from West Metro today? Yep, I'm here. Hi, Ron. Uh, hi, all. Thank you for having me. And just a few updates of upcoming things for the chamber. Uh, we have women in business next week. We have a speaker from Jeff Coe Schools Foundation speaking, as well as college sitters, nannies, and tutors talking about how to balance it all, work-life balance, as well as remote schooling. So for those that have the kids running around in the background of the call, uh, this one's for you. And um, we're all learning new things right now. So tune in, that is on September 22nd at 8 a.m. on Zoom. And our biggest news is our Taste of the West is back this year. If you've been in years past, it's usually 1,200 to 1,600 people at the Jeffco Fairgrounds. Obviously that's not gonna be happening this year, unfortunately, but we are gonna revamp and revitalize it as a DIY. So a do-it-yourself Taste of the West. So all you have to do is buy a card, think of like a school fundraiser card with the punch outs. Um, and you're gonna go to 10 plus restaurants across Jeffco, restaurants, breweries, wineries, distilleries. Um, 
and it's just to help support our local restaurants, get people in the door. You're more than welcome to sit down and enjoy a meal after you get your taste, but there will also be a digital voting ballot to figure out who won the best taste that year. So um, cards just went on sale yesterday. So I hope you guys can all join us the week to participate. It's four days. It's October 5th through October 8th. Um, and you just take that card to different restaurants across uh, Jetco and get it signed off and vote. So that's all we have. Um, look forward to seeing you guys soon in person, hopefully. Thank you, Madison. And, and if you haven't already, get that information to Katie, uh, info at wiscofax.org uh, and, and she'll, it sounds like that's already happened, but we'll get that up on the, on the website as well. Uh, so thank you for being here this morning. Uh, Jeffco BRC, anyone uh, hear from that organization? Oh. West Colfax Kiwanis? Yes, uh, we are meeting in person with uh, proper precautions. And uh, we've actually participated in some fundraising events and, and given some money out, uh, most notably to Outdoor Lab in the last month. Uh, we are still most, our most important piece at this point is just new membership. So if you are interested at all, uh, let me know and uh, maybe we'll meet at the Elks and talk about it. <laughs> they would welcome that. You'd get a, a thumbs up from Jerry. So yes. Okay. Uh, are there any other uh, associations or community neighborhoods that uh, we have not uh, recognized that have uh, anything to add today? I will mention, uh, I, I participate in the Denver Parade of Lights that is now uh, not going to happen. They're, they're going to have the floats uh, positioned around downtown Denver for three weeks at the end of November and early December uh, uh, to allow people to come down and, and see those. I, I participated in the past. I'm part of the Distinguished Clown Brigade. They want us to come down in our clown outfits and be float ambassadors. So. We'll, we'll, we'll get you some information on how that's gonna how that's gonna happen. But uh, um, in any event, uh, anything else, folks? Uh, yeah, Ron, um, can I do a Lakewood Arts update just because I have one, even though they're not here? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Cool. So Lakewood Arts is doing their mask and hats fundraiser. You can find more information about it on their website and also on the West Colfax website and also on the Forty West website. But they had artists create uh, masks because of COVID nineteen and hats that are done in all sorts of traditional cultural world styles that they're treating as a fundraiser this year. So that starts in October and it goes through the whole month. I encourage you to check it out. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I have an announcement if I could. Yes, yes, Tracy. Thank you. So I do a town meeting every month and my town meeting is this Saturday at 1030 and it's in this Zoom land. Um, we are talking about the Gallagher Amendment, so people that want more um, information about that amendment, but we are also talking about the family, uh, uh, family medical leave uh, ballot initiative. So that's on Zoom. Um, you can get that Zoom information at Tracy for Jeffco on Facebook. So everybody join us. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? I'd like to do an uh, update from the Action Center, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely, Pam. Yes, thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you for a little time. I just wanted to let everyone know that we're still providing services in an outdoor fashion, um, four days a week at the Action Center, and we're seeing numbers continuing, continuing to go up. Um, we're serving probably somewhere between six and 700 households a week. Um, that's about 2,000 individuals a week that are coming by for support with food. Um, we're also seeing our rent assistance requests going up and not just the number of people requesting assistance but the amount of money uh, that they're needing to be able to stay housed, meaning they're falling behind um, several months in their payments. So there's a lot of concern about growing need in the community. Um, we've been really grateful for the support that we've received from the cities and from the county to be able to meet that need. 
but I just did want to say that we're concerned about what happens when CARES Act dollars do begin to uh, decline and um, we will be continuing to reach out and tell you all what's happening, keep, uh, keep you informed about how the need is con continuing to be present or what's happening in terms of those trends. But um, we are doing our very best to continue to meet that growing need. And uh, we've reopened our clothing. We're um, reopening all of our services um, in you know, altered ways. So most of our services are happening that happened before. They're just happening online or through phone calls. Um, so please continue to let folks know that the Action Center is here for them. We have decreased barriers. Folks can come once a week um, if they're in need of food support and or other services. We are taking donations on our dock uh, for food and clothing. Right now, um, with that blast of winter that we had last week, people are really starting to think about blankets and winter coats and gloves and hats and all of those things. So if you do have those in your closets, um, we are ready to take them from you. We are being asked for those every day. Um, and we will continue with our programming around Thanksgiving giving out extra food for Thanksgiving at a Thanksgiving drive that'll take place at Tarumo BCT this year, just off of Colfax. Um, so look for that event. And if you'd like to learn more about what's happening at the Action Center, ask me any questions. I'll put my information in the chat. We also have a fireside chat happening uh, next week on Friday, and that will give a lot of updates about uh, what we're doing and how we're um, we're working to meet the, the needs in the communities. Thanks a lot for the, for the time. Thank you, Pam. I, I know uh, I can speak on behalf of the WCCA board and the, and the WCCA community that we're big, big supporters of the Action Center. And as you mentioned, it's that time of year where you can, you can benefit the, the community with the extra donations. So, so do, uh, do, do stay plugged in and, and thank you for the, that input. And thank um, you for that support. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, anyone else uh, before we sign off? Hey, Ron, this is Adam. Can I just add to to what Pam kind of along the line sure. of what Pam said? There's a there's a September 23rd deadline coming up for dollars for the pandemic EBT, which can provide up to two hundred and seventy nine dollars for a child for a purchase. And it looks like, according to some of the numbers that I've seen. There are about 117,000 kids in the metro area that parents haven't applied for those types of resources. And it looks like maybe 17,000 people in Jefferson County. And so if you do know people that are in need, certainly with kids, um, there's a lot of opportunity out there or some opportunity, but there is a deadline coming up on September 23rd. And if anybody wants more information on that, I'm happy to send that to you. Uh, apaul at lakewood.org. Thank you for that. Okay, folks, uh, we are about uh, 10 minutes ahead of schedule. Uh, we appreciate everyone being here today. We have uh, recorded uh, this, uh, this meeting today and uh, we will figure out how to post that up on uh, westcolfax.org. So, uh, if you know people that would benefit from, from any part of the discussion today, the candidates, the ballot initiatives, uh, the communities that, that we help to support, uh, please point them to our, our website. And, and we appreciate your time today. Uh, we will uh, be with you a month from now, uh, likely again in a Zoom format. So help us get the word out that uh, you know we, we, we think it's a good time to grow our community and, and we think we're a good way to efficiently keep people updated on kind of what's happening so we'd like to we'd like to grow our audience so each of you uh, maybe think about inviting a, a friend a, a relative a co-worker to to log in next month and, and good luck to all the candidates uh, we wish you well as you uh, close in on the the, the, the uh, the, the, the election season. Uh, and with that, uh, I will uh, uh, conclude the meeting. Thanks, Ron. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Everyone. Have a great day. Have a great rest of your week. Enjoy. Bye.